Amen. If you would please open your Bibles to John chapter 11, John chapter 11, as we continue our study in the Gospel of John. Our study is going to be in verses 38 through 54. As we begin this morning, let us remember that faith is taking God at His Word. Faith is taking God at His Word. And we want to keep that really as a real focus. We, we talk about faith a lot. We certainly try to live by faith. But it's not always easy, is it? There's many, many challenges that we can face in a day's time, isn't there? And in troubling times. But the wonderful thing that we can know is that we know who holds the day. We always know who holds the day. And as our study takes us, and we're looking in chapter 11 at the story of Lazarus, this is a really wonderful story in many different ways. We're going to begin our, our scripture reading here. Well, we're going to not really do a scripture reading, but we'll, we'll begin by looking at verses uh, 21 in chapter 11 through 27. We want to remember that Martha has professed her faith to our Lord Jesus Christ in our last study. In verse 21 it says, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou ask of God, God will give it thee. And Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise. And Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into this world. Lord, we ask your blessing upon our study here this morning. Direct our thoughts and our steps and, 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 and our reading and all, the, all that we're worshiping here this morning unto thee, Lord. Help us to grow a little, a little more in your grace and truth. And Father, to know, Father, you even better than we did before we came in this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, really, nowhere in the Bible is the deity of Christ more evident than in this, than in this story of Lazarus. And also, nowhere is his humanity more evident as well. Not just to the tomb, not, not, uh, not, not, just, uh, not, not, not just in him going to the tomb. So, well, let me start all over again. I want to see this. But anyway, we want to see how he goes to the tomb. When last week when we left him, he had been, uh, we talked about how he came in. We saw the reaction of Martha, Mary, Mary and all that had been said. And we touched on that a little bit here this morning. And now we're picking it up where he's actually going to the tomb. And we notice how the crowd goes with him. Martha, of course, and Mary, but also everyone else. As they had seen uh, Mary leave, they all went out. And we see that not only, is, uh, not only is he just going to the tomb with Jesus, but all that were going to the tomb with him. And they, and, and they all were on their way there. Why? Because of sin. You see, Jesus was on his way to the tomb for the same reason. But he was going for their sin, wasn't he? However, he was the... He, he was on the way to the tomb just the same, to open the grim portals forever for himself and for all who believed. So he allowed himself to be led by Martha and Mary, where, where, where Lazarus had been buried. And we looked last week at how he wept, and we want to think about that for a moment. We looked at that pretty good last week, but it's good to keep it in mind. He wept because he was a man, acquainted with sorrow and with, and with grief. He wept for the sorrow of Martha and Mary and for Lazarus' friends. And he wept because his heart was literally broken at the sadness of death and the sorrow that knew no solace. He also wept because he was God. He could see what they could not see. Lazarus was in paradise. Surrounded by the saints of God, the angel, the angelic host was there standing by. He was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the spirits of, of many just men that have been made perfect, as we've already seen in the Old Testament in that place. And he was in a land where time 
stand still. We're all eagerly waiting for that earth-shaking time of the triumphant Son of God coming into the kingdom again. You see, Lazarus was barely introduced to paradise. Think about that for a few moments. He'd had that experience going into paradise. And Jesus now was going to call him back into the anguish, into this challenging world of pain and all that he had just left. And he was being called back again. I think that's something to weep over. And I can see why the Lord would have wept at that point in time, thinking about all of these different things that were going on. We see his humanity, and we also see him and his lordship, both sides. But as we know, it's all for the glory of God and all for his purpose, isn't it? And that's what we're seeing here in this wonderful study of Lazarus here this morning. You know, here we see where the answer, if we're looking in verse 37, we see something else. It says, and some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should, should have not have died? We see a limited faith, but I want you to think about that just a minute. What does it do? I used the word just, just now. What was the word? Limited, right? Limited faith. You know, I thought about that a little bit in my study. I thought limited, you know, that's the way a lot of us are. We have faith, but we limit that faith, don't we? We know with God all things are possible. The Word of God teaches us that, isn't there? There's only two things God can't do, and it's really only just one. They are what? He cannot lie, and He cannot sin. And of course, since lying is a sin, we could say he, just, he cannot sin, right? We could say that. That's exactly what, what it would be. Those are the only things He can do. Everything else He can do, literally everything is held together, including all the universe, by His very Word. And that is really something when we think about it, in the, con in the context of what it is as well. When we think about the vastness of all that we see, and all of creation and all that there is, the marvel of what we can look at in our own world and see all that, all that, all that is in our own world, the balance and the way everything works and interworks with everything else, the marvel of our own bodies and how they work and how an eye can look across a room and see something and and understand it and put it together in a way of whether it's beautiful or what. It's an amazing thing when we look at all that there is and understand there is so much more at the same time by faith if we know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But we should have the confidence to know that everything is in His hands. You know, this is sort of the question that atheists and agnostics and unbelievers ask quite often. They'll say, why does God, an omnipotent God, if He is a good God, allow suffering and sorrow and injustice and pain and death. Why does he do that? If he's all-powerful, then he's not all-good. If he's not all-good, then he's not all-powerful. Otherwise, he would intervene. What do they miss? God is holy. God is holy. He is perfect. Righteousness can have no fellowship with unrighteousness, and he is, uh, he is perfect and, uh, and completely righteous in everything that he does. Sin can have no fellowship without, with, 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 non, with, with sin. I mean, sin, sin can have no, no, no fellowship with, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, righteousness. In Romans 3.10 it says, As it is written, there is no, no, none righteous, no not, not one. And we see that uh, we also know in Romans 3, 27, it tells us something else. It says, for what? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Who is all? It is all, isn't it, anybody? There is no hope for man outside of the Creator Himself that has brought salvation into this world in the most greatest and most humblest of way that it could have been brought. You know, because God is perfect, He required a perfect sacrifice. A perfect sacrifice. Therefore, the answer is to that question is He does, doesn't He? 
God does answer that question to the atheist, to the non-believer, to the agnostic, whomever. The answer is simply this. It is Jesus Christ. He does. How does he do it? By sending his beloved son, Jesus Christ, into the world to do a work that nobody, no man could ever do. None of us can ever do for ourselves. It required a perfect sacrifice. It required God himself to come in and make a way of escape for each and every one of us to pay a price that no man could pay. So when they're asking, why did Jesus prevent Lazarus' death? Part of the answer is going to be as we continue our study. It's for God's glory. He called Lazarus back for God's glory and for an example for us, too, at the same time as we will see. Now, in verse 38, where we really kind of begin our study here this morning, it says, Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone laid upon it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been in dead for four days. And Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Think about those verses now. We look at this. Take away the stone. You know, can you imagine being one of those that had been there uh, mourning with, with Mary and Martha, and you were at the graveside now, and here you were, and you're standing and saying, he wants to take away the stone. Martha's just told him about how it, he's going to stink it. You know, this is, this is something that is a very strange thing to ask, isn't it? Wow, why would he want to do that? You know, May just thought that they were, he was so taken with grief, he just wanted to see Lazarus for himself one last time. There could be a lot of explanations. The Bible just tells us that part of it. But Martha knew something. She, she knew by this time he stinketh. Do you think the Lord didn't know that? I think he did. Probably did, didn't he? You know, the Lord doesn't mean told anything, does he? But we do say things, don't we? And th 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 thankfully, he's very understanding with us. But notice what the, how the Lord responds. He says what? He says, said I not unto thee. Said I not unto thee. And think about how short a time that this is what he's saying here. When did he say that? Well, we read about that in verse 23. We just looked at a few minutes ago. When he said in John eleven twenty three, 23, he said, thy brother shall rise. He'd already just told her, your brother's going to rise. And he also told her that he is what? The resurrection and the life. Please notice, he says, he is. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Remember we talked about last week, it's not about knowing the most knowledgeable person about a resurrection or all there's to know about, about the resurrection or all there's to know about life. He is. He is the resurrection and he is the life. That's one of the primary things to look at in, in, in our study as we look at these things. And then he challenges her, doesn't he? She had also, in a sense, it seems like she'd already forgotten her own declaration of faith. Had she not declared in verse 27, Thou art the Son of God? Thou art the Messiah? Thou art God? And yet we see here that she's questioning it, in a sense, as he's seeing it again. It's almost as if Jesus was saying, Martha, there may be some excuse for others objecting to the, to the tomb being open. But you, Martha? But you, Martha? Simply saying, look, you should know. I just told you that if thou would believe us, thou should see the glory of God, as he says in verse 40. You see, Jesus was fully capable of this miracle without the belief of, uh, or without the faith of Martha or Mary. But they would only get half of the blessing that way, or less than half in my mind. But if they would not believe, they would not see the glory of God. We have to realize this is more about than just raising Lazarus back to life, and they're going to be so excited about having him back, right? They're going to be very excited about that. They could see the end result without seeing the glory of God. 
and been happy, but they would have missed that glory with God and his fulfillment of that plan. You see, the greatest miracle wasn't so much the raising of Lazarus, was it? That was a tremendous miracle in and of itself. That was a great thing. But there's a greater miracle than that, and that is the one doing the miracle. That is the great miracle. That is the real miracle to see and to understand and the glory of God and who he is that he can and does raise the dead. In verse 41, it goes on to say, then they took the stone away from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I know that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. You know, there's a, there's a remarkable, I think we see a great step of, of faith here on the part of both Martha and Mary as they act in faith, and they did, by obeying Jesus' request. Martha had already said, he stinketh. He already, she already recognized how dead, what could possibly rolling away that stone goes. But she doesn't question it, does she? She and Mary obviously agreed to allow that so that the, the others would, would do what, what the Lord had asked. How we see our faith sometimes go up and down, don't we? We can have tremendous faith at one moment and weak in another moment. But let us remember, let's always bring it to the Lord and let, let us put our confidence in Him. We see that Jesus probably dealt with Martha in particular here according to a deliberate step of intending to truly stretch out her faith, to build up her faith. You see, when our faith is tested and we pass those tests, we stretch out more so. It helps us to grow more and more in faith, doesn't it? The more we exercise faith, the stronger we, the stronger we become in our faith. We don't become more, we don't lose our faith, but the more we become, the stronger we become, don't we? If we feed more upon the things of the world, the more we see the things of the world. If we feed upon the things of the Lord, the more spiritual we see. We have more spiritual insight. We see things more from God's perspective. And we also see that God, Jesus gave her a promise, didn't he? He said to her, he said, that thy brother will rise. And then Jesus drew the attention to the truth. And that was himself. When he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And Jesus called upon her to confess her faith, didn't, didn't he? When he said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then he said, what? Believest thou this? Do you believe this? And of course, her answer was, she confessed her faith. She said in verse 27, she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So she confesses all of this, and she knows it. But just like us, I can speak for myself. I can't speak for you. But we have waning faith, don't we? We go here and we go there. And even just that we look at this really short span of time where all this is happening, and we see her going back and forth in many ways. But the truth of the matter is, my friends, the consistency is, is that Jesus Christ is God and he's always there. And his truth is forever and ever and ever, and it's never changing. And his mercy and his love and his grace is also eternal. The power of prayer was rooted probably in his private prayer Jesus had already had. But notice how what we see about this. There was no pomp or incarnation or anything like that. No wrestling in this prayer even. But simply the words of thanksgiving. And the way he prayed was as if Lazarus had already returned. During his humiliation on earth, these acts of power were done by him, not by the glory of his, of his own, which he, had, which he had already laid aside, but by the mighty works of the Father in him and in answer to prayer. You see, Jesus Christ, laid as we know, didn't lay aside his deity, did he? He never laid aside his deity. But he did lay aside his, um, 
uh, but he, but he did but he did he, he did lay lay aside his glory in that sense. He laid it aside, and he he, he was the perfect man. And he demonstrated a perfect man in complete obedience and dependence upon a holy God. And we see his relationship with the Father in that just as we should have in that sense. But yet he still was God at the same time. Yes, we know how they worked in complete unison in all things. And then in verse 43 it goes on to say, And when, and when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus? Come forth. Wow, that was complicated, wasn't it? I mean, we'd had to rehearse that for a while to get that one right. There's a lot of words in there to try to understand. Think about how simple so much of the gospel is. And the Lord puts on a level that we can certainly grasp. Lazarus, come forth. And what's Lazarus do? He comes forth. He comes forth, it goes on to say in verse 44, and he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin, and Jesus said unto them, loose him and let him go. You know, we think about how simple and pacific that, that, uh, that, that command was, simply pacific, saying Lazarus come forth. You know, Jesus had said on a previous occasion, it's good to remember this, that the time would come when all who were in their graves, would, would hear his voice. Now, this is important to kind of look at this as we consider our study here this morning. In, in John 5, in verse 28, it says, The Lord said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, into which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Now notice, And shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. The word I want you to see here is what? All. All will come forth when he calls. But here on this occasion we see that a single dem- it's just a single demonstration of his authority over death. A single one. The Lord singled out Lazarus by name. By name he singled him out and named it that he was to rise And Jesus spoke to this dead body as if Lazarus had already, was already alive because he is God. And in Romans 4, 17, we say, who giveth life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Remember, Jesus spoke and it was. Didn't he? All things came by him, don't we? All things were made by him and for him and without him was not Anything made, does death and sin have any power over him? Does he not have authority over everything? And certainly in this occasion we're seeing that. And he's given a wonderful demonstration of what is to come too. So that they might believe and see with their own eyes and their faith would be so strengthened as they're going to face what these next few days or the next within the next few, few months are going are to entail, which is going to be quite a challenge. Good lesson for us. We see that when Jesus came forth, there's a lot of commentaries, a lot of attitudes. Well, how did he come forth? The Bible doesn't tell us. <laughs> you know, some think, and I, I'm kind of one of those, he just, when Jesus said it and he came forth, he just kind of came floating right on out. No trouble for the Lord, right? Others say, well, you know, it might have been he wasn't wrapped up all that tight and he could still kind of shuffle his way out the door, you know. I mean, there's all kinds of different things you get. But the point is, he did. He did. And then we see the next command here. We see the voice that had directed the dead at the present rise. Jesus had, we, we see how Jesus literally defeats death here and would come to conquer death. So we see that Jesus, as he says, he is, isn't he? He is the, he says what? Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. He is life. He is all that there is. And we see this. 
His face was wrapped with a cloth. Lazarus, Lazarus was, resurrection, was resurrected. He arose both uh, bound in his grave clothes, for he would need them again. But you know, an interesting point is, when we look at Jesus, later as we'll see in the scriptures, he left his grave, his grave clothes behind in the tomb. Why? He was never going to need them again. Does Lazarus need them again? Yep, he's going to die one day, isn't he? He's going to face death again. Yep, I can understand Lazarus. The Lord had a lot of faith in Lazarus. He was a friend. I can just imagine Lazarus, his faith now, as he's grown. And we know how the day that the Lord, when he rose, what happened? We don't have a lot on that, but a little bit we have in, a little bit we hear in the Bible about what, what happens. There were those that came up out of the grave at that time too, wasn't there? And what were they? They were witnesses for the Lord. All of these things we see. My friends, we have nothing to fear. Our, our, secure, our future is secure. Spurgeon says, he was the one that kind of said that he, he might have walked and shuffled his way out. So that was Spurgeon. <laughs> but, you know, everybody can, and he's a good man. I, mean, I think a lot of him. But Jesus said, loose him and let him go. And Jesus did that miraculous, did miraculously remove the grave clothes from Lazarus. But he asked his attendants to do so. Jesus did only what God could do. This is a point that one of the commentators keeps making over and over again. And the point he's really making is, is that, is it possible for God to do everything? Yes, absolutely. Can he do it all? Does he really need you or I? But what's the point? He uses you and I, doesn't he? There's purpose for you and I. God has a reason for us. We're to do what we can do and then leave what we can't do to God. We're to be about our Father's business. We're to be working and doing the things that God has laid on us, whatever that is, whatever, whatever opportunities that we have, wherever the Lord shows us our responsibilities are, we're to be about those things, aren't we? Yes, we are, by God's grace. Yes, what man can do for himself, God will not do for him, and the Christian people can do for sinners that they must not expect what the Lord can do. You know, I thought what I, when I was thinking about this and reading about this and looking at it, what came to my mind was that verse that says this. It says what? It says, one soweth, one watereth, but what? God gives the increase. But he uses men... For to be the sower, to be the one that are watering, to be doing, as you can see, things that they can do, and then trusting God and leaving that for the Lord to do. What a blessing that is, isn't it? Now we see, in, as we begin in verse 45, we see there's a plot now to kill Jesus. There are those that are wanting him dead, more so than ever before. And this is probably one of the saddest parts of this when we look at this here this morning. We see in verse 45, it says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. Now we talk about the Jews. We talked about how many of these were officials, maybe Pharisees, uh, different ones that were actually in the uh, ministry. These were typically men we would think of power. We talked about, we thought, think that based on what we can see from the Bible, that, uh, th that Lazarus and his family were well regarded in the community, well known, it sounds like, in Jerusalem. Remember, it was only a couple of miles from Jerusalem. And there was uh, quite a lot of people that, that really were very impressed with, with him. And it appears that they were pretty wealthy or at least well off, just looking at all the surroundings and things that had gone on. And we know how Jesus had spent quite a bit of time with them as a family, and he really did love them. Very, uh, they were all very, very close in that sense. What a blessing to see this. But we see how there's only going to be some that are going to believe. Notice it doesn't say all, it just says many. In the next verse it says, But some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told what things Jesus had done. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were a Pharisee, 
and you profess that you believed and trusted in God, and you believed and truly trusted in what you were quote, supposedly teaching and presenting to everyone else, when you had heard about all the things that Jesus had done, and now that he had literally raised Lazarus from the dead, what would be your reaction? Would it not, boss, should have been, wow, let's, let's run out and see this for our, let's, let's go out and see Jesus and, and worship him. Let's, let's find out, this is the Messiah, he's got to be the Messiah. Let's find out, let's get into this. Was that their reaction? Not at all. They, and those that went to tell the Pharisees, I don't believe went with that kind of intent in their heart, they went with the other kind of intent. You see, they chose the world over God, didn't they? They made a decision. I would rather have the grace of the Pharisees and what they can do for me and the, and the position that maybe I can get with them or the, being their good graces, more importantly, than being with the Lord over here. This single man that was going out and, and, and doing all of these things and the miracles and all that he had done, and he just proven now that he had power even over death. And it says in verse 40, but some of them went their way to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. And then notice, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we? For this man doth many miracles. If we let this alone, all men will believe on him and Rome shall come and take away both, please notice the word, our place and nation. I want you to think about the word our for a minute. Is it theirs? Who does it really belong to? Most of this was done, most of them, most of, uh, again, the commentators I'm looking at, believe that the reason was they were focused on the temple. They loved that temple. They worshiped that temple that was still being built. That was so important to them above everything else. And they were worried about themselves too. And it's our. Whose is it? It's God's. It's God's house, isn't it? They're God's people. It's God's nation. And they're supposed to be serving the God. God. And to keep that focus there. That's one little thing that we can see here. Yes, sir? No, I, I, I think, yeah, I, I think if you would have... My, my, my point, I think, uh, and not... Uh, Homer, I'm saying that yes in some ways, but I think what the key is here, they knew what they were doing. They knew how they were going to be received to the Pharisees. They knew that they were going to... They were looking for favor with the Pharisees. That was their primary for, for a purpose of doing this. And the Pharisees... Not only that, the Pharisees now, we're going to see an astonishing thing to happen here in just a few minutes. We see that some saw both the power and the sympathy of Jesus and yet responded in working against him. Astonished is a good word for all that we're seeing here. Some had even seen the miracles and, they, and what it did, it actually hardened their hearts against it. Not only say, but they, but they uh, conspired to destroy the most humane, Amable and glorious Savior. That's what Clark says. Spurgeon calls this reporting to the, to the Pharisees. He says, some of the meanest conduct that has ever been recorded in history was this event. John, authority of the account of what, of what passed here. We, could, we might look to maybe Joseph uh, of, of uh, of, er of, of Aramea or, or, Nic or, or Nic uh, Nicodemus or some of the other members of Sanhedrin that may have explained to him what actually went on during that council. But we see all of these things taking place and we see the hardening of hearts and we see the division that takes place. In verse 49 it goes on to say, And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all. Verse 50, Now consider, that is expedient for us, that one man should die for the people and, and that the whole nation not perish. You know, Caiaphas, you might say, was logical, but it certainly wasn't moral, was it? It was logical for one man to die for the people, but it was not moral to reject the Messiah and to seek the death of the innocent man. I'm going to say this again, but think about it. If they truly believed, if they truly were true men of God in the sense that they hadn't been so corrupted in their own way 
of serving self. And they can be deceived. They can deceive themselves, thinking they're doing all the right things for God, but they've gotten so far away from it. If you understand who God is, who would you rather be in the corner of? Raw or wrong can't stand against him. None can stand against him. He is going to be victorious in whatever he does. But you need to take faith and believe in this man that doesn't have a home, wanders around, doing miracles, and telling of glorious things that no man can do or know except that come from God. Proving over and over again by his very life that he is who he says he is. Which one are you going to seek out? Yes. Many seek out the death of the innocent man, seeking to destroy the Christ. And this speaks not, and he speaks not of himself, but being the high priest that year, we're talking about Caiaphas now, he prophesies that Jesus should die for the nation. Caiaphas gave an unconscious and involuntary prophecy. John was careful, I think, in his deal here to more emphasize the office rather than the man, being the high priest that year, he prophesies. He is urging them to put Jesus to death, but the form of the words he uses unconsciously are prophetic. In John 52 it says, and not, <clears throat> and not that nation only, but that also, he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. John explains that this unconscious prophecy of Caiaphas was greater than he could have ever imagined. The death of Jesus also would gather together in one the sheep of another fold that Jesus had previously spoken about, like in John 10, 10, 10 to 16, we looked at a while back. Who's this other group? The, 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 the Gentiles, probably you and I in this room. So let us consider... This is something really to consider. We've kind of touched on it already. But think about this for a few minutes. The religious leaders privately admitted that Jesus performed signs that were, that were authentic. These were authentic signs. They were real. They could see them, the miracles that he had done. And the claim, the works that he did, and the witness of him, as we see in 1025, Their opposition charge, first they opposed Jesus because they weren't convinced that he was the Messiah. That's the first thing that they did. Now, they opposed Jesus because they were convinced that he was the Messiah. Just the opposite. Now we've gone completely over there. They admitted the miracles, but looked how they treat the miracle worker. They denied him. They opposed him. And they were afraid of his influence over the people. Verse 47, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council together and said, What do we? For this man doth many miracles. If we, let, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the religious leaders knew the logical response to the witness of the works of Jesus Christ was to believe on him, but they feared more and more what, what would happen if they did. They said, the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. Again, we see that word, our, as Jesus attracted more and more followers. As Jesus attracts more and more followers, the religious leader feared the Romans would regard them as a significant threat. One especially to keep their power and their prestige and wondered how to deal with this problem with Jesus. Most commentators believe that our place refers, we talked about, to the temple as we talked about, they, they made such an idol of it. This telling that the religious leaders thought of the temple as our place, as it belongs to them, we have to be very cautious of. And we need to also realize it can happen in our own situations, in our own circles. When we begin to look at a church or a building or a denomination or whatever it is, we're looking at that rather than the Lord. It is God's. We're God's. We're God's people. We belong to Him. The church belongs to him. He is the church. He's the head of the church. And we're, we had the privilege of being a part of that church if you're a child of God here this morning. 
Yes, we want to be careful of some of these things. In verse 53, it goes on to say, Then from that day forward, they took counsel together to, to put him to death. It seems that the thinking of the council was something like this. Never mind about the miracles, or his teaching, or the beauty of his character. Let's just forget about all that. His life is a perpetual danger to our, to, to our prerogatives. So I vote for death, Caiaphas, and the council voted with him. The majority voted with him to put him to death. And then it tells us in verse 54, Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence unto a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. You see, Jesus did, didn't fear them or anything like that. We know that. We've already seen how he said before his hour had not come. And just as we talked about in our own lives, it's all in God's hands. When and How long we're here, what our challenges are, he knows all of those things. He knew that his time would be the time that it was going to be. No man could touch him. We've talked about how no, numerous times we see how he just disappears out of the crowd. The Bible doesn't tell us specifically. It tells us he went in among them. We don't know how that happened, but the Bible tells us how it happened. But anyway, we know that those things happen. And now we see in verse 55, it goes on to say, and the Jewish Passover was nigh at hand. And many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they Jesus, and then, they, then sought they for Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What think ye? That he, will, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he, where, where he were, he should show it that they might take him. You see, this means that in the last few days before the Passover, at which time Jesus would be betrayed, arrested, condemned, and crucified, truly, this was the moment as we see throughout his ministry, and we're going to kind of be switching gears as we go, go, go continue our study starting in chapter 12 next week. But this is the moment. Choose. Choose. Jesus divided. There were those that believed and came to faith in Jesus Christ as their Redeemer and their Savior and their Messiah. And there were those that chose over here to reject the Messiah division and sometimes just as we see in this study right here this morning no matter how overwhelming the evidence is those that do not have a hardened heart will reject it they will compromise they will come up with all kinds of rationalizations of why what is and what isn't the truth is we are blessed because the answer is simple it's christ put your faith in christ the raising of Lazarus is, is the climax, really, of the seven sign miracles. That sometimes they're talked about the seven signs of the miracles. The first was, as we may want to look at, was the turning the water into wine at the wedding. We know about that. That was the joy of eternal life that was kind of demonstrated there. Second was the healing of the royal officer's son. It was a condition of eternal life, which is what? Faith, isn't it? Faith. And then it was the healing of the man of Bethsaida. That is the power of life. And then we saw the feeding of the 5,000, food for life. That's our food. Remember, Jesus said, I don't need anything. His food was, was heavenly food, wasn't it? It's what we get from the Lord. He's he walking in, the, and then we saw him walking on the water. That shows us the guidance of life. Keep our eyes on Jesus, like Peter did, and when he took him off, what happened? Wasn't too good, was it? Yep. And then there was a sign of, rest, of, of restoration, and, that, that, and, and that's life for the life. And we can go on and on about light. I love the light, thinking about the light of, of the world. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light for life. We have that light by God's grace if you're a child of God. And, of course, the last one is the one we've just studied this morning, the raising of Lazarus, the victory over life, over death. Victory, I mean, the victory over death that we have through life in Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ, let us close with this, said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He is the light of the world. And with that, we'll go ahead and close.